<coughs> Welcome to the seventh of our series on, um, on beauty. Um, last week's lecture was on beauty and happiness, and this week we go to the other extreme of beauty and terror. Um, over the centuries, there's been no shortage of tyrants who've sponsored the arts, but in the 20th century, perhaps more than ever, um, tyrants have tended to actively use the arts as political instruments. So it's very appropriate that our title should be Beauty by Terror, Russo-Soviet Perspectives. Now, speaker is Yevgeny Dobrienko, who's professor of Russian and Slavonic studies at Sheffield University. He's a Ukrainian who gained his doctorate in Russian literature at Odessa before he moved to Moscow. And then he went from Moscow to the United States, teaching at Duke University, among other universities. And he, in the year 2000, he moved to Nottingham University and, uh, and then on to Sheffield, where he is now, of course, in 2007. Professor Dobrienko's voluminous publications cover the whole range of artistic uh, activity of the Soviet and, and actually post-Soviet era, film, visual arts, literature, and so on. And a recurring theme in them, I understand, has been the paradoxical role that beauty has played in the imposition of power. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Dobrenko. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the courageous choice of the topic for this year Darwin College lecture series. Because even talking about the beauty, uh, the topic of beauty is a challenge to the present status quo. As this subject, which was earlier so urgent and widely discussed, even if it was in a highly negative context, as for example in the era of modernism, and became a, a, the basis for an entire discipline aesthetics, has lost its former popularity. The subject of beauty became unfashionable, even a sign of aesthetic and political retrogression. Why did it happen? Uh, there was, of course, a tradition formulated back in uh, the modernist era that linked beauty to the past and therefore considered an interest in it to be a manifestation of obscurantism. Nonetheless, the reason that is much later and much more felt by us today is that beauty was inextricably linked to the terrible totalitarian experiences experience of the 20th century. This is why many consider it fundamentally blasphemous to use positive aesthetic categories and the most sacred among them, beauty, in the, discussion, in the description of totalitarian cultures. Poetry and beauty right along with it is impossible after Auschwitz it seems even more impossible, so to speak, during Auschwitz. And was it not right of Umberto Eco to simply omit these dark oliveys of the 20th century history in his landmark ontology on beauty, a history of Western idea, starting with the aesthetic ideal of ancient Greece and ending with the beauty of machines, abstract forms, provocation and consumption. Eka does not even mention totalitarian beauty. As if the revival of beauty and the production of totalitarian kitsch in Nazi Germany, Franco Spain, Stalinist Russia, or indeed Eko's native Italy of 1932 when he was born, never happened. Or as if this painful period of history did not constitute an epicenter of the Western history of the 20th century. The problem here is purely perceptual. Beauty is always tied to truth, happiness, and harmony. 
and it always has a, pi a highly positive aura. One cannot deny, deny, however, another important fact. Beauty is always tied to art. Art has always been situated close to power, whether sacred or secular. Power is also always based on coercion. Hence, one might say that coercion is the subconscious of beauty, and beauty is sublimated violence. And in fact, uh, um, all, the, all of aesthetics, as Terry Eagleton has so acutely observed, is, I quote, no more than a name for the political unconscious. It is simply the way social harmony registers itself on our senses, imprints itself in, on our sensibilities. The beautiful is just political order lived out on the body, the way it strikes the eyes and stirs the heart." End quote. Beauty always appeals to harmony, order, and law. It has always been thought that the higher the degree of social organization, the more fully the essence of beauty and harmony, as opposed to chaos and anarchy, uh, is manifested in it. And it is no accident that the very idea of beauty developed in bosom of the church for centuries. Secularism, however, is tied to democratization, i.e. with the disintegration of the existing order. And what comes to replace beauty is the sublime. The 20th century was one that saw two world wars and terrible terroristic regimes. The rear guard battles of patriarchal societies with the new age, with individualism, capitalism, progress, and political modernization, turned out to be much more terrible and bloodier than the first skirmishes in the 19th century. In traditional societies, beauty is visible and palpable, and therefore, it is indeed the most real legitimization of the Ancien Regime. Using beauty as cover, traditional society defend themselves from modernity. What was called beauty in Europe, uh, in 1930s Europe, was in fact the sublime, the very notion of which was by no accident the product of the new age. It is a um, traumatic reaction to the challenge of individualism. On the whole, aesthetics deals with social trauma. With some intent, Nietzsche called aesthetics applied psychology. This is why sublime, as the most typical of all aesthetic moods, is so central. It is always traumatic, as it is a desacralized, decadent, fallen beauty. One that has become secular and devoid of divine grace. The sublime is an expression of the shock of the individual confronting the absolute. This is just the variety of the, uh, of the sublime on which Romanticism and Classicism fed. The totalitarian sublime has a quite different origin. It feeds off the trauma of the collective experience of the patriarchal, culturally immature masses when this experience is shaken by terror. This kind of experience has no internal freedom, since it is completely swallowed up by the interiorization of terror. Thus, it can produce nothing but a surrogate. Its product is totalitarian kitsch. But totalitarian regimes need the sublime not only for the psychological interiorization of its own grandeur by individuals, but also to conceal its purely repressive essence. Beauty is the unarticulate idea of the absolute, embodied in images. It can only be represented. The sublime, by contrast, is the idea of the absolute that has no representation and cannot be embodied. Any attempt to embody it is deliberately inadequate. Beauty appeals to the ready-made image, while the sublime appeals to the autonomy 
of subjective experience, to individual freedom. Beauty is tied to ethics. What ethics calls good, art portrays as the beautiful. This is not the case with the sublime, which is so immersed in traumatic experience that it is generally indifferent to ethics. Beauty cannot be conceived without truth. It is a manifestation of truth. But the sublime is different to truth. One could also say that the beautiful is an established world, while the sublime is a world in the process of formation. The beautiful is the petrified sublime. There are different ways of looking at the relationship between them. Not if you would say that beauty is by far more elevated since it, it appeals to an absolute, while the sublime is just a conflict between the ideal and the individual, which seeks to perfect its forms but fails to find them. There are also many who, on the contrary, suppose that beauty is uh, petrifaction and fetish, while the sublime itself is full of life, emotional experience, and exaltation. Be that as it may, beauty in the 20th century has always been turned into a basis for anti-modernist hysterics, or on the other hand, was a constant target for the modernist attacks. So it is no coincidence that what is posited as new, as a break with tradition, is almost always perceived as a challenge to beauty. But this is only one aspect of the sublime. Another side of it is a profound internal disharmony. Edmund Burke directly stated that the source of the sublime is that which is capable of causing suffering or danger. Everything that is horrible and by no means what is beautiful. Therefore, we will not err if we say that the, core, that the source of the sublime is fear. In fact, what we understand as totalitarian beauty is nothing other than sublimated terror. And that is why these images are full of profound trauma. Behind their pompous grandeur, monumental harmony, and transcendency lies entropy, violence, and horror of annihilation famous Burke's definition of sublime, delightful horror. Totalitarian cultures did not know beauty in their pomposity, monumentalism, and megalomania. There is no only, not only a political dimension, but also an aesthetic one. The exalted forms of the sublime passed off as the beautiful. The sublime seeks to pass for the beautiful because precisely what these cultures needed was beauty that would appeal to truth. What is beautiful is true, cannot be false. Hence the enormous legitimizing potential of beauty. In Judeo-Christian tradition, the link between beauty and truth is asserted via a link between beauty and freedom. But something quite different is also true the obvious connection between beauty and unfreedom. Evgeny Zamyatin's um, dystopian novel, We, begins with this remarkable diary entry by the hero, I quote. Ballet, square harmony. Why beautiful? Why is the dance beautiful? Answer, because it is and free movement. Because the deep meaning of the dance is contained in its absolute ecstatic submission in the ideal non-freedom. It is true that our ancestors, if it's true that our ancestors would abandon themselves in dancing at the most inspired moments of their lives, religious mysteries, military parades, then it means only one thing. The, most, uh, the, the instinct of non-freedom, as beautiful itself, has been characteristics of, uh, characteristic of human nature from ancient times." End quote. 
In the process of creating a harmonized nation, all dictatorship, all dictatorships realized the cult of beauty in basically similar forms of theatricalization, sacralization, mythologization, the production of visual superreality, and finally, in the project itself of creating of a new man. I would like to address, however, what made these cultures different in the ways they realized this cult of social harmonization. That beauty acquires dif acquired different forms in the, the different dictatorships is beyond doubt. In Soviet Russia, for example, which lagged behind Western civilization with respect to technology, the collision between patriarchal culture and this Western civilization was so extreme that it gave uh, rise to the most radical forms of industrial avant-garde art, complete rejection of beauty. French Cubists, German Dadaists, and Italian Futurists, all of course proclaimed the destruction of, of beauty. There is nothing new in it. Essentially, modernism is nothing but a revolt against the former ideal of beauty. But the extreme radicalism of the Russian rejection of beauty is tied to the uniqueness of Russian situation. As opposed to the West, modernization here was introduced from outside, and it collided with deeply uh, patriarchal culture. The gap between westernized modernist project and uh, traditional patriarchal reality was shocking, and the population unreadiness for, for it was enormous. But at least at, in one respect, Russian situation was above this, this difference. Soviet modernization was based on similar social premise tied to democratization of social order. Such democratization became a religion of the new age. It led to profound political implication as well as aesthetic ones. The democratization of traditional societies is a complex and dangerous process. Since these societies are often not only unprepared for liberalization, but actively oppose it. In this respect, the breakdown into a new middle age in the 20th century was no accident. Each mobiliz mobilizational regime saw itself not as a continuation of history, but as a corrective, uh, uh, but, but as a corrective of it. Fundamental to each is a rejection of the course of the historical process that aims at secularization, modernization, individualism, and the rejection of patriarchal values and the peasant way of life. These regimes attempted to turn history backwards. And in doing so, they um, referenced antiquity. It allowed them to, keep, uh, to skip over the detested liberal bourgeois period as if uh, starting all over again. And simultaneously, it guaranteed continuity. Since the 20th century was the century uh, of the cult of progress, all of the totalitarianism that grew out of revolutions and war positioned themselves as progressive, oriented toward the future and to, the, uh, to uh, ideas of national revival. Hitler constructed his thousand year Reich. The Soviet Union laid a path for humanities to the bright world of eternal communism. These regimes uh, uh, rushed towards economic modernization. The main thing that made them alike was the answer to the question of the value and the boundaries of modernizing projects. In them, the price paid for economic modernization was political conservation, the social status quo, and the historical revenge. Essentially, these regimes were oriented not to the future, but to the past. Modernization in them uh, were realized in the name of preservation of or a return to the pre-capitalist, peasant, patriarchal, and feudal militaristic past. Uh, 
Paradoxically, uh, modernization was not supposed to let the future come, but rather to preserve these traditional societies. Having gone backward, these, uh, they, they, they took even their aesthetic ideals from the past. Thus, uh, at the heart of these societies lies the, lies the idea of retardation, preservation rather than transformation of the uh, traditional order. Hence, the orientation to exemplars uh, from the past, from antiquity. At the ideological level, this society relies on priestly rather than legal practices, on morality rather than law, on the faith rather than rationality. Hence the reliance on a mystical principle, on the sublime past of as beauty. If for the modernist beauty was the, if, if, if for the po uh, modernist beauty was the future, then for totalitarian regimes, such beauty was the present, to the degree that it drew its inspiration from the past. In the name of traditional beauty, Nazi culture rejected degenerative modernism, and Stalinism fought against formalism and explained to Shostakovich and Eisenstein that the language of art must be simple and accessible to the broad masses. Both campaigns, by the way, uh, were in fact running in parallel in 1936 and 1937 at the height of the Great Terror in the USSR. One need only examine the plans and sketches for the reconstruction of Moscow in mid-30s to understand that Stalinism rejected rationalism and functionalism in favor of an exuberant Baroque an, exalt, an ex, uh, exaltation of formal decoration. Stalinism appeals not so much to rational forms as to the things that struck the, peasant, uh, struck the peasants pouring into the cities in the 1920s and 30s. Empire style, the church, and the decorations of rich in, in interiors. Neither in Germany not even less so in Italy, did the masses experience such a culture shock since um, they lived in a completely different visual milieu. One needs only look at the station of the Moscow Metro uh, in order to glimpse the development of the forms of the Tsarist Tower. These forms are sti are, are, uh, and stylizations modeled the patriarchal imagery and were the embodiment of the archetype of the ideal dwelling of yesterday's peasant. In Stalinism, in, in Stalinism this um, hinged on a no less radical appeal uh, to an ancient ideal of beauty, specifically to Greece and Rome. Never mind that practically all the European dictatorship, dictatorships hark back to them. Stalinism reproduced this ideal stylistically in a most consistent way. In Abraham Rome's 1934 film, A Strict Youth, discussions about the new socialist morality takes place in the stadium as if brought directly from Greece and Rome into the Union of Soviets. Even the poses that the characters assume are Greek. In the Stalinist era, art is only a reflection of the beauty of, this, of the Soviet life. Generally speaking, the rejection of utility in favor of self-sufficient beauty reaches uh, no less a degree of radicalization in Stalinist culture than the productionism uh, that had preceded it in the rejection of uh, beauty in favor of utility. In Germany, um, the rejection of traditional beauty in Dadaism and Expressionism were motivated by a completely different reason, the unwillingness of the artistic elites 
to stay within the paradigm uh, of bourgeois beauty. The modernist impulse had a different basis than it did in Russia. This is why the Nazi rejection of degenerative um, art was interpreted as a return to folk culture that was designed with the myth of blood and soil as a point of departure. Stylistically, that it was, uh, this was formulated with, references, with reference to Rome, but with a strong Nordic, uh, Nordic uh, uh, component that was not present in Stalinism. One needs only glance at the imperial chancellery and minister of propaganda buildings erected in Berlin to see the difference between Stalinist Baroque and the uh, restrained Nazi empire style. The difference is even more obvious when comparing the two main architectural projects of Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia. The Germania project in Berlin and the palace of Soviets in Moscow. Megalomania unites these two projects. The Germania project, the creation of a new capital for the thousand year Reich instead of Berlin intended to construct the highest cupola in the world, alongside, with the, uh, alongside which the Brandenburg gates, uh, it's over here. <laughs> and for the matter of fact, all, all of all Berlin would seem like a grain of sand. But the Stalinist palace of Soviet the Soviets was conceived as the tallest, tallest building in the world. On the top of the palace, a 120 meters statue of Lenin. 120 meters uh, was to be erected. Uh, this pinnacle of Stalinist megalomania was supposed uh, uh, to be the palace for the people, combining the pomposity of the Egyptian pyramids, the grandeur of ancient Rome, and the sanctity of temple architecture. The palace of Soviets is an example of the use of traditional sacred images of beauty for secular political purposes. It was uh, to stand in the site of Moscow's lar largest cathedral, which was demolished in 1931. These projects are similar. However, serious stylistic differences begin, begin to appear uh, and are especially, especially obvious when one compares the art of Stalinism, Nazism, and Italian fascism. These are, these are most uh, famous images, of course. Uh, Stalinist architecture, Nazi, and uh, Italian uh, uh, in, under Mussolini. Futurism was still an official, uh, officially recognized art uh, in painting, and the so-called rationalist fascist style was dominant in Italian architecture. This latter was far removed from uh, ancient Rome's exemplars of beauty, of course, and in fact relied on constructivism, mainly because the broad uh, uh, masses in Italy, as opposed to those in Russia, lived in a surrounding of classical beauty. And therefore, revolutionary culture suggested something different to them. For the Soviet masses, the Tsar's palaces was such a something. But for the Italians, it was constructivism, uh, which removed the decorative element uh, from the classical beauty surrounding them. In Germany, the reference to ancient Rome were combined with constructivist severity. But in Russia, empire style, uh, style was represented in an almost Baroque style of execution. By contrast, um, the art of Franco's Spain combined empire style with Catholic kitsch, uh, a clear example of which all right. Clear example of which um, 
uh, are the Basilica and Francus uh, tomb in the Valley of the Fallen. It's over here. Uh, I just want you to, uh, to compare. This is, of course, um, this is uh, Italy. This is uh, Nazi Germany. This is post-war Moscow. Um, again, Italy, Spain, Soviet Union. This is actually Kiev, not Moscow, just for change. Um, um, it was, uh, uh, if, if we compare the facades and, and oval colonnades, in Italian, native, uh, uh, Nazi, Spanish, and Soviet architecture, the stylistic difference uh, strikes us uh, vividly. Um, as follows from the preceding, I would argue the importance, the importance uh, of the aesthetic dimension and therefore of taking an aesthetic approach to different totalitarian regimes. We have to evaluate the importance of Stalinist, Nazi, and fascist beauty from a viewpoint of the social trauma condensed in these cultures. Uh, derealization of life achieved a truly finished form in it. In this aestheticized world, everything was immersed into such a nirvana of style that consumption of this art might well be compared to the effect of profound anesthesia. Indeed, the more pain society must endure, the more and stronger anesthetic it needs. That is, the more beautiful life has to become. Ultimately, the ability of Soviet society to endure terror was directly profound to the unbearable beauty of Stalinism. The total aestheticization of politics, however, is not by any means tied only to the instrumentalization of aesthetics to strengthen the effectiveness of propaganda, nor only to the uh, creation of a mass society, nor only to the development of technologies, not to severely traumatize society's rejection of rationalism. It is also linked with the aesthetic nature of the totalitarian, totalitarian state itself. The ideal artist, writer, or architect is someone who brings a plan and realizes it according to his vision, with no concessions to reality. That is, he holds full authority over reality. In other words, he is the leader. The leader was not simply represented as an artist demiurge, an architect, painter, or poet. He, in fact, was such an artist. In completing the creative act, an artist demiurge uh, transforms reality by subjugating it to his artistic will. Reality is his raw material, which is harmonized as a result of the creative force exerted by the artist over the material. As a matter of fact, the content of the creative act is precisely in this act of exertion of will. And thus, it is congruent to the uh, exercise of political will. In the Soviet Union, the leader was proclaimed to be the embodiment of, I quote, the objectively beautiful. If we compare the visual renderings of the leader's images in different totalitarian cultures, we see that um, the unrealized fantasies of the masses are transferred onto the leader, the Führer, il duce, el caudillo. The structure of the patriarchal uh, authoritarian family facilitates this displacement. As William Reich demonstrated in his uh, uh, classical book, the, the Mass Psychology of Fascism, as long ago as in 1933, 
this is precisely the source of the uh, national narcissism that sublimates the emotional enslavement of an individual into the cult of the nation, and in Soviet case, the, the, the uh, cult of the um, uh, hegemonic class. Uh, Reich said in 1933 what did not become a commonplace until the late 20th century. The masses unknowingly wanted fascism, and one might add Stalinism and the other dictatorships that ruled the world in the 20th century and continue to rule it in the 21st. This order could not have been imposed upon them against their will. The aggressive potential of the traditional societies in, in crisis situations is enormous. The frustration of the masses with their inability to adequately respond to the challenges of modernization, limitless, and the leader simply reveals them and through the institutions of political power, directs and realizes them. Fascism, Stalinism, and Nazism are all uh, 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 primary, uh, primarily the problem of the masses and not of Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, or Mao Zedong. The list might be lengthened by many other names of currently active political figures. Uh, if Mussolini was portrayed in futuristic way, this first portrait, um, avant-garde style, then Hitler, on the contrary, was portrayed romantically. Each of these leaders harked back to his own exemplar. Franco was portrayed according to the classic, uh, uh, classicist, uh, um, uh, uh, classic parade portrait. Mussolini styled himself after a Renaissance era portrait. This is my favorite one. Um, Hitler in the manner of Duha or, or a romantic landscape. In Salazar's and Stalin's cases, Salazar and Stalin's cases, um, the romantic landscape is of emptiness and solitude definitely relies on um, a, um, an emphatically realist style. Beauty is linked with uh, sacrality. But although all these regimes had very different relationships to God and were often based on uh, theomachism, iconoclasm and atheism. In actuality, they were not, of course, essentially secular. Not coincidentally, did they always make, uh, make a reference to the people and uh, to popular spirit, as they saw in them either an expression of ideals of the progressive class, uh, in the Soviet case, or as a higher race in the Nazi case, or as a defenders of nation and tradition in the Italian case, or as, expo as the exponents of traditional patriarchal and Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, virtues in Franco, Spain, or Salazar, Portugal, etc., etc. In this respect, Stalinist culture is particularly interesting since it could allow itself to officially proclaim atheism while, uh, while uh, nonetheless preserving all the attributes of sacrality in the cult of leaders. Why could this happen in Soviet Russia? Because being completely demiurgic, it simply duplicated the sacrality in itself. It had no needs, need uh, of an external God. Everything that these cultures present is a beautiful image of the common people. The people are the def uh, uh, definitive referent of terror. They are the source of terror, which is simply formulated ideologically and institutionalized politically by the reigning power. The people 
are in fact the mouthpiece uh, of the ultimate will. And therefore, they become a subject equal to God, or rather, they uh, uh, cease to need God. Uh, for this reason, they become the only object of the cult. The atheism of a terror that relies on collective bodies and includes God in itself, in the form of a people, is the atheism of a new religion capable of feeding a social life based on coercion with itself. Art imposes upon us much more profound, even archetypical notions uh, of the greatness of the people than a simple visual image. Uh, furthermore, without art, this people cannot be created. Just as a church is an institution for maintaining and promoting a religious cult, totalitarian regimes are institutions for maintaining and promoting the cult of the patriarchal masses. Totalitarian dictatorships engaged in the production of collective bodies. Totalitarian art is the production of collective identity. Accordingly, it is one of the basic elements of these regimes. No less important than the KGB, the Gestapo, or the Gulag. Essentially, art takes the place, uh, takes the place uh, of the church. Hence, as we have seen, these cultures manifest a special, a, a, a special status for the shaping of public spaces. Thus also the uh, reliance on, on con, um, convention in the form of traditional beauty, transformed and sublimated, and on the collective identity rather than on the personality of the artist. This culture always harks back to folklore and to the epic canon, in which not only the ontological irrationality of these cultures, but also their genealogy are manifested. Their references to the land and fertility and to blood and soil reveal the peasant origin of what is imagined by the new proletarianized urban masses, who, although they have been subjected to urbanization, have continued to see themselves in a specifically folkloric context. To interiorize uh, terror, these masses need the uh, primordial beauty of an epic. Striking in Soviet painting are the pictures that portray total uh, exaltation that is um, inseparable from the land and fertility. In these pictures, in these pictures, uh, these two are from Moscow Metro, first two. Um, Uh, 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 in these pictures, one can read the genealogy of the gays in Stalinist culture. We are confronted with a pure, uh, pure exemplar of the sublime. These masses see only in the pitch dark of the non-existent. That is, they see not what is, but only their own unrealized possibilities. It is just, <coughs> it is just these possibilities that block in these collective bodies the vision of themselves as the bodies to which something is happening. Another point of reference, as we have seen, is classical antiquity. Its visual representations uh, are in architecture, in its reliance on the people, Stalinist architecture, 
Stalinist architecture harks back to the exemplars of folk art. Folk art. This is uh, particularly evident in the All Union Agricultural Exhibition 1939, wherein the pavilions combine images of abundant fruit, fruit uh, uh, femininity, fertility, uh, a surplus of agricultural products, and an abundance of fountains. The exhibition was described as an example, uh, exemplar of beauty. It was itself a work of art and brought realized socialism together with beauty. In identifying with his own image in the exhibition, the spectator himself adorned. Since, as a reviewer wrote, I quote uh, one of the reviewers, um, an important feature of the exhibition is that the uh, achievements in the area of agriculture uh, and industry are directly tied in the conscious of the Soviet people to a sense of the beauty of that they have made with their own hands. If this beauty was handmade, then the beauty of the female body in its natural state might be considered the best stylistic indicator. The woman, <clears throat> as you see, the, this is Soviet role, and this is Nazi one. Um, the woman in Soviet painting is always represented as, a, as the embodiment of quietness, simplicity, and joyful labor, which is especially emphasized when she is style, uh, styled after ancient models. Female nudity is so rare here that it uh, even became a subject of discussion in Boris Yakovlev's painting, Dispute About Art, 1946, the, the central one. It's quite uh, interesting pain, uh, painting, 1946, against a backdrop of uh, a revolutionary and battle uh, uh, canvases, an almost Rubinesque uh, uh, Diane is depicted. In Nazi painting, the woman is presented in a completely different way, full of exaltation and sensuality. But specifically because the Soviet woman is portrayed much more realistically, um, uh, in, in Soviet visual art, the evolution of the Soviet ideal of beauty is quite apparent in the history of the change in female images. In the revolutionary era poster, women were portrayed uh, as revolutionaries and soldiers. Um, and quite often images were created through montage. This is a very famous one uh, the, over here. Um, in the first five-year plan era, the images were primarily of working women and uh, in the later 30s, female images were athletic and healthy. 30s, 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 30s. However, by the time of late Stalinism, post-World War II, uh, we see a woman in a commercial poster that uh, reflects the post-war Stalinist style of luxury. The austerity of revolutionary times has passed and has been replaced uh, with the new bourgeois values. The woman is uh, no longer presented as a model of proletarian humility. She drinks from the, from the bourgeois elegant uh, uh, crystal wine glass. This is a commercial of Soviet champagne over here. Uh, uh, and far from proletarian champagne. Uh, or, or else uh, she is busy with such quite a feminine thing as buying beautiful fabrics over here. Um, 
which was completely alien to, uh, 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 to the way uh, Soviet uh, uh, woman was depicted in revolution and um, at, at labor looking more, rather more like a man. It's very interesting to compare this one, this poster with this one. <laughs> Just compare these two. <clears throat> Petty bourgeois beauty became a luxury and uh, permeated Soviet everyday life as it was officially presented, of course. Um, as opposed to the other European totalitarian dictatorships, Stalinism lasted a long time and died very slowly. Perhaps this is why Stalinism alone produced a, a reflective tendency in art, a curious postmodern wonderland. Two Moscow conceptualist artists, Vitaly Komar and Alexander Melamid, emigrated to the United States in the 1970s, uh, where they created a new style called Sots Art, following the example, of course, pop art. Uh, this style uh, parodies Soviet political imagery, subverting the, and, and taking it to a real uh, level of absurdity. Uh, I took just three uh, paintings from, uh, from this whole series, um, uh, 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 Nostalgic Socialist Realism series. Uh, and, and these are precisely the beauty of Stalinist empire style that it's at the center of this, this picture. Uh, in the pictures, um, socialist realism this is socialist realism. <laughs> and another one, uh, uh, Stalin and Muses. Stalin's uh, uh, figures um, in, in, in a classicist setting surrounded by ancient goddesses. In view of the Kremlin in a romantic landscape, the central one, this one, uh, a red curtain is held open by unseen hands to reveal a beautiful landscape, complete with ruins, as if the Soviet empire has become the real ancient Rome, a new an ancient Rome, and the Kremlin floating like a fairy tale castle uh, on an island in, a, in an azure sea. Traditional beauty visualizes the traumatic experience of um, unrealized Soviet greatness producing a quasi-futuristic and simultaneously nostalgic post-Soviet phantasmagoria. To conclude, Dostoevsky famously asserted that beauty will save the world. The history of the 20th century in which political beauty dominated, that is, there was simply no distinction between beauty and utility does not inspire optimism. But let us make no mistake. Beauty is inseparable from political utility in the same way that religion is inseparable from politics. Essentially, beauty is the religion of secular society. That is why the politicization of beauty and the beautification of i.e. aestheticization of politics, I refer to uh, Walter Benjamin, of course, um, in um, the 20th century, uh, where the response to the total social secularization of the, uh, of the new age. We must not forget either, however, that this is a purely Western phenomenon. In obscurantist societies, in traditional, let's say, uh, uh, forms of despotism, wherein religion successfully opposes secularity, religion specifically is the uh, driving and legitimizing force of politics. Therefore, it would be correct to say that beauty, along with religion, is only one of the functions of the uh, spiritual essence of mankind. Both of them refer to a utopia of collective salvation. Beauty is the paradise lost 
of the new age person. In order to save the world, to paraphrase Dostoevsky, beauty must emerge from the shadow of the sublime. That is, it must again become a religion. The price of salvation for the European man in this case would be a return to the Middle Ages. Thank you for your attention. While Professor Dobrenko was talking, I was struggling to try and remember those lines from Yeats about the center will not hold, a, a, a terrible beauty is born, written of the, I think, of the, the rebellion and civil war in, 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 in Ireland. He'd, we've just had a wonderful account of the, uh, uh, the use of buildings to inspire awe. I couldn't help but think that um, our great contemporary of Cam building of Cambridge, the University Library, is undoubtedly <laughs> designed to inspire or um, how many different facets art, art to identify the worker, the, the leader with the people, art to identify the leader with, with myths, art as the production, as a process of production of collective identity. Of course, there was some very fine art in all those images, some, some technically superb, superb painters. Um, the use of beauty to legitimize the regime's uh, underlying uh, terror and, and brutality. And I suppose ultimately what I come away with the wonderful paradox that um, socialist realism was anything but realistic. For a fascinating talk, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>